Amen to that. Welcome to Memorial Road. Glad you're here with us this morning. Whether you've been a member for a long time here or you're just starting your spiritual, spiritual journey with us, we are honored to have you worship with this church family today. If you're just checking us out, maybe you've been here for a few weeks or maybe this is your first time and you want to know more about this church family, let me invite, invite you back next week for an event that we call First Cup. It's a great time to ask a few questions and get to know a little more about this church family. It happens in a room called The Parlor, um, which is just to these doors to the right, and hopefully you can join us there next week. Just got a note before I got up here. If you lost your keys um, in the World Bible School room in this hallway, Lloyd Deal has your keys, so you can go get them after the service. Last fall, I heard an interesting story. Uh, there was a guy named Lawrence. He is a painter. He's been in the painting business since 1978. There's a picture of Lawrence. So he's experienced. He knows what he's doing. Been doing it a long time. Well, a guy named Robert asks Lawrence to do a project for him. It's a, it's a house, and uh, Robert wants Lawrence to paint the entire exterior of the house. And so Lawrence goes out for an estimate, looks at the house, and said, this is, you know, I can do this. Give me, me and my team a few days, and we can knock this, knock this out. That'll cost you $5,000. And Robert said, that's fine. That's a fair price. When can you start? And Lawrence said, well, we'll start next week. Well, Lawrence gets his team of people, and they, they get up early one morning, and they work all day painting this house, get all their rollers out and brushes out and tape out, and they, they're working, 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 work the second day, and, and they work the third day, and they get done just like Lawrence said. And so when the project is over, Lawrence goes, finds Robert, gives him the bill, and says, we're done with your house. Um, now I'm here to collect the payment. And Robert uh, kind of looks at the invoice and looks at his house, and he says, no, I'm not going to give you $5,000. And Lawrence says, what are you talking about? I, I did everything just like you told me to do. It was the color you wanted, everything exactly the way you wanted me to do it. And Robert said, no, I told you to paint that house, not that house. You see, hard work doesn't really count if you are working on the wrong project. And to add insult to injury, this house that Lawrence painted wasn't some great beige color or something neutral like that. No, it was bright yellow. And so and these guys got so mad at each other that they went and sued each other and they're in court somewhere now. But point goes, if you're working on the wrong project, then it really doesn't matter exactly how hard you are working. I learned this lesson the hard way a few years ago. I got my master's in Bible at Oklahoma Christian and I was towards the end of that program taking a class with Dr. John Harrison who goes to church here. Yes, it's a wonderful joy. I get to preach to my professors who know way more about the Bible than I do. But John's, uh, I'm in this class with John and... It's towards the end, and I'm, I'm trying to wrap up some final projects. So I actually rem remember being on a staff retreat, and it's in the middle of the night, and I'm trying to get this final. There are actually two final projects I'm trying to do. One is a test, so I take that online. This other project is a book review, and so I set out to write a book review. Now, the good news is I'd actually read this book, and book reviews are a lot easier when you've read the book. Not that I ever wrote book reviews without reading the book, but I had read this one. And so I knew I could do it, so I sat down on my computer and started typing through the night. And two or three in the morning, finally got done with it, attached it to an email, hit send, and then went to bed. And the next day, sometime in the afternoon, I get an email back from Dr. Harrison, and he said, Phil, comma, great book review, period, wrong book, period. And I was like, oh, no. And what I wanted to say is, doesn't it count? Like, I worked hard. Like, I'm not the greatest writer, but I'm a decent writer, and didn't you read it, and was, isn't it a good review? And, and the answer to that is no, it doesn't count. Close does not count in grad school. Even if you're working really hard on something, if it's the wrong project, then the work doesn't really count. As we journey through the story of Israel, we get to this point where Israel's been working on something, but God comes to them and lets them know that the project they've been working on... To, isn't the right project. They've been painting the wrong house. And this is the point in Israel where exile is looming, and in fact, the northern nation of Israel gets taken over by the Assyrians. And there's a guy named Isaiah, which goes into captivity with them, and Isaiah serves as a commentator on what's happening in the life of Israel. And so you can almost view Isaiah as a college professor uh, who meets with a student after the finals are over, and the student comes in and says, I just don't understand how I failed your class. And Isaiah 
or this professor would come back and say, well, kind of turn, maybe turn his computer screen and say, let me show you what you did, and then let me show you what you need to do to make it better. And so that's kind of what Isaiah is doing here. He's saying, yep, you guys are going into exile. Here's what's going on, and here's what you can do to get better. One particular chapter in the book of Isaiah really hits the problem on the head. And so if you have a Bible, I'm going to be in Isaiah chapter 58, almost the whole sermon. Here's what the Bible says, Isaiah 58, verse 1. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they said, and you have not seen it? Now this is a fascinating opening paragraph to this chapter because what it does is it describes to us the spiritual state of Israel. If you've read your Bible very much, often we go to the Old Testament and we assume that Israel is all bad, that they're always making bad decisions, that they're always making mistakes, that they're never following God. That's not necessarily true. This paragraph gives us a glimpse into the heart of Israel and what we realize is that Israel is not absolutely evil. They are absolutely a mixture, just like you and me. I mean, look at these descriptions here. Verse 2, they, they're a people who seeks the presence of God. They ask God for decisions, so they're a praying people. They're eager for nearness, so they're a worshiping people. They engage in the practice of fasting, so they're a disciplined people. I mean, how many, how many of us have fasted in the last several months? You see, Israel is actually pretty devout. They're eager. They want to worship God. They want to pray. I mean, if these people existed today, they would be the front runners for class chairman. They'd be the front runners for elders or ministers. These would be the type of people you would want your kids to date. You want people to be around Christians who pray, who worship, who are devout, who fast. Those are markers of very spiritual people. And so why in the world does God throw them out like he's throwing garbage in a trash can? Well, here's one clue. The NLT has a great translation of a verse I just read to you. It simply says this. The people say this to God. Why aren't you impressed? Side note, never pray that to God. It's a terrible idea. Also a side note, you should never say that on a date of, of any, any form. Just... You should really just never say that. It's just a terrible line. Why are you impressed with me? Like, what kind of a heart is that? It's almost like these people are saying, God, look what we've done. We prayed. We went to the temple. We even had the discipline to fast to you. And the other day I was at my neighbor's house, and they were eating these lamb chops, and I was really hungry, and I, I denied myself. Why aren't you impressed with me, God? Well, God tells them in the next verse why he's not impressed. Verse 3, here's, here's why. This is God speaking. On the day of your fasting, you do as, as you please, and you exploit all of your workers. Your fasting ends with quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen only a day for people to humble themselves? Now, when we read this paragraph, it's a kind of a convicting paragraph, but there's something we kind of miss being a culture that's several thousand years removed from the original readers of this. We are in a culture now where fasting is something that we might think about, but it's pretty optional. Most people do not engage in that practice. The Israelites were in a culture where fasting was a very normal part of what it meant to be a Jew. The way that you hear the word worship is very similar to the way that they would have heard the word fasting. So what I want to do is read the exact same paragraph, but instead of using the word fasting, I'm going to use the word worship, and the way that you hear this paragraph is probably the way that they heard their words back in the day. On the day of your worship, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your worship ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You can't worship as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of worship I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? 
And so you see what God is doing here is he's asking all these rhetorical questions and he's trying to bring home a point to his people. And the point is this, you can have the perfect prayers, you can have the perfect praise, you can have the perfect fast, but if your lifestyle does not match your worship, then God's not impressed. You see, their blind eye to the oppression happening in this world had left a terrible impression in the mind of God. You see, they had painted the wrong house. One phrase really stuck out to me from that passage, and it's the phrase, only a day, in verse 5. Is this the kind of worship I have chosen? Only a day for people to come and humble themselves? And it made me really think, do I really think that God's going to be impressed with me because there's one day out of the week that I come before him and worship? Do you think that God's going to evaluate you solely on, based on what happens maybe in one hour of the week? Do you think that if you get your worship perfect, and if you get your prayers perfect, and you, if you get your offering perfect, that somehow that's going to cover up the rest of the 167 hours in a week? God would say no. In fact, God answers his rhetorical questions this way in the next paragraph in Isaiah 58. God simply says this, no. This is the kind of fast I want, or this is the kind of worship I want. Listen very carefully to the voice of God here. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from your relatives who need your help. And so what God does here is he lays out this is his vision of what authentic worship should look like. You see, for the Israelites, when you go back and read the first few verses, their worship, they had consistency because it says day after day they sought God. And they had piety. Because it says day after day they prayed and they sought the nearness of God and they wanted to be with God. But the one thing they did not have was justice. And what God is suggesting here is that authentic worship should produce tangible justice. You see, you can go through your whole life thinking that as long as I get up every once in a while, once a week, sing some songs, make myself feel good, and I'm really pious before God, you can think that that automatically is going to please the Lord. But what God is suggesting here is he's saying no. That does not impress me. If you are not actively seeking the justice of the oppressed in your community, then I am not impressed with your worship. You see, Israel had failed the test. Sure, they'd gone to the temple. Sure, they'd said their prayers. But they had missed the poor at the gate of the temple. They hadn't cared to notice the kids in their community without parents. They had missed the foreigners among them who were unwelcome. You see, here's a question for you. Which calls forth more guilt in your life? Missing church service or missing service? You see, most of us have been conditioned to feel extraordinarily guilty if we were to ever miss church service. But why don't we feel guilty for missing service, for missing justice? Are those, is worship service the thing that impresses God? You see, as I read through this paragraph in Isaiah 58, one of the things I'm convicted of is just looking at the words, here, here are the things that impress God. Taking care of the hungry, sheltering the homeless, being kind to prisoners, lifting burdens of people. And so I have to, the question, I have to ask the question for myself, why is it that I feel guilty for missing church service, but I don't really feel guilty for missing out service towards other people. What has happened in my life that I only think that pleasing God is in one of these areas, but not the other area? You see, Isaiah 58 is for all of us, because what God is saying is authentic worship should produce justice. So the question is, in your life, what are you doing to actively seek the justice of this city? Another scary part of this verse is verse 7, or this passage is verse 7, because in this verse, Isaiah says, don't hide from relatives who need your help. And this one was really convicting to me as well, because sometimes we view our homes as the place where we have the right to act like a jerk. 
and we can treat other people great, but when we get in our house, whether it's our husband or our wife or our parents or our sons or our daughters, we feel like it's okay to treat them like worthless people. But in this passage, what Isaiah is doing is he is adding your relatives in the same paragraph as he adds the homeless and the needy. So for those of you that think you have the free right to be a jerk to your family, Isaiah 58 has a problem with that. Now, back to the main thought here. Obviously, God is not honored when we disrespect church. God feels no praise when we marginalize meeting together as his people. And I'm not saying in this sermon that we should neglect the importance of this. Clearly in Scripture, meeting together as the body of Christ is extremely valuable to God. And in Hebrews 10, the author says that we should not give up the habit of meeting together because there's some people who are in the habit of doing that. Uh, even you think about Jesus when he gets really angry at, in the temple scene and he gets out his whip and he starts driving all the money changers out of the temple. Well, why is he doing that? It's because the people are disrespecting the house of God. In fact, Jesus quotes Isaiah 56, which is two chapters before the chapter I'm preaching out of today. Jesus quotes that text to say, hey, the house of God is not a den of robbers. The house of God should be called a house of prayer. So Jesus Christ is very clear. It does not honor God to disrespect his worship. It does not honor God to treat church as second rate. But what I'm saying is neither does it honor God to treat justice as second rate. You see, nowhere in the Bible do you read that worship can be a replacement for justice. And yet for so many people, including myself, for some reason, we think that as long as we just do church right and do prayers right and do our songs right, that somehow we're going to be exempt from justice. That's what the entire chapter is about. What God is saying is, no, that's not the case. I am not impressed with your worship because it's not leading towards tangible justice. You see, where in Scripture do you ever find that you can get a free pass from acts of justice just because you're a faithful churchgoer? Did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount, in the past, God used to love justice, but now I tell you, God loves just us. No, he didn't say that. If there was any place in the Bible where Jesus could have reframed God's vision of justice in the Old Testament, it would have been in the Sermon on the Mount because much of the Sermon on the Mount is a reframe of Old Testament thinking. And yet, in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere, Jesus affirms God's passion for justice. I mean, just look at this brief survey of Scripture. Romans 1, Paul says, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is a spiritual act of what? Of worship. Worship is sacrifice. James talks about it in his little book. He said, true religion is this, taking care of widows and orphans. Worship is justice. Back to Isaiah, Isaiah 117. Scripture says this, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. At the end of the book of Isaiah, Scripture reads this, the Lord looked down and was displeased that there was no worship. No. He was displeased because there was no justice. Think about the messianic passages from the book of Isaiah. Several times in this great book, Isaiah prophesies about the coming of a Messiah who will save the world from their sins. Jesus Christ fulfilled these prophecies. Look at the way that Isaiah talks about the Messiah. Chapter 61, the Lord has anointed me. This is the Messiah talking in first person. The Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up brokenheartedness, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to comfort all who mourn. A few verses later, I, the Lord, love justice. You see, when Jesus started his ministry, he got up to a temple one day and he had Isaiah read from a scroll and then his sermon, all it was is he basically said, this has been fulfilled today in your hearing. So Jesus Christ, when he launched his kingdom, it was based out of Isaiah 61, which is all about justice. So let me ask you, are you painting the right house? A friend of mine told me a story the other day. He said that at the church he worships at, a different church in our region, he said that recently a man came to worship, 
and he walked into the lobby, and my friend had already gone into the auditorium, and as he was walking into the auditorium, my friend looked back, and he saw this guy who had walked into the lobby, and my friend immediately knew this guy is not someone who normally comes to church. He was dressed uh, in a really unkempt way. Um, my friend said as he walked back to go talk to the man, he smelled the man before he entered the lobby. Direct quote from my friend, he said, Phil, to be honest, this, there are animals who smell better than this man. And so my friend walks back to the lobby and starts talking to this guy and kind of gets the story. And the guy, you know, he's just kind of down on his luck and he needs a ride to another city, which is 30 miles away. And so my friend grabs another friend for safety and they get in their car and drive this guy 30 miles away to where he needs on a Sunday. Now, as my friend tells me the story, at the end of the, st end of the story, his head kind of sinks and he says, but you know, Phil, I'm going to have to answer on the day of judgment for what I did that day. I didn't handle it right. And I said, what do you mean? Why didn't you handle that right? He said, no, no, no. I think God's really, really displeased with me because what I was supposed to do is I should have gone out to that man and brought him into the auditorium to church that day. And I looked back at my friend and I said, you know, I guess you might be right, but I'm going to respectfully disagree. My guess is that, is that on Judgment Day, Jesus Christ is going to look at you and he's going to say, hey, whenever you gave rides to smelly, unkempt people, who acted and seemed like they didn't belong to my church, whenever you gave rides to people like that, you were actually giving a ride to me. You see, sometimes God calls us to invite people in, but sometimes God calls us to move out. And what Isaiah is saying in this passage is, if you only concentrate your efforts on what happens inside a worship service or inside the temple, then you're missing out on a huge part of the mission of God. You're missing out on justice. You see, sometimes I wonder what would happen if we were just as passionate about justice in the world as we were worship in the church. In fact, this chapter offers us some pretty compelling promises as far as what happens to people who make this the mission of their life. Here's what the Bible says. Verse 10, If you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You see, so many of us want the supernatural strength from God. Like we walk around every day and life's tough and we pray for strength. What God promises here is when you spend yourself on behalf of the oppressed in the world, God gives you supernatural strength to keep doing that. So one of the great promises to practicers of justice is the supernatural strength that comes from the Lord. Second promise God, make, God makes is in verse 12. It's a new name. This is an amazing line here. It's very simple. God says, if you do this, if you spend yourself on behalf of the weak, he says, you will be called repairer of broken walls. What a name. Like that's a name I want on a plaque in my office. That's a name I wish God would give me. That's an amazing title. In one sense, the title means it's talking about the next few decades when the people come back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. But in a broader sense, what Isaiah is saying is if you take on the mission of God, the justice of God towards the least of these in the world, you are rebuilding a city that God will finally totally build one day in the future. In fact, one of the greatest chapters in Isaiah that I'm not going to get to talk about be just because of time's sake is Isaiah 65. At the end of the book, Isaiah paints a picture of what the city of God theoretically should look like. And it's an amazing chapter. You should go read it tonight. Isaiah talks about that the great city of God will be a, a city where children will thrive. Children won't die anymore. It'll be a city where the elderly also will thrive. It'll be a city where there are no homeless people because everybody has homes. It'll be a city where people have meaningful work. It will be a city in, in which people delight in the presence of each other and people delight in the presence of God. Uh, it, it'll be a city in which the, the wolf uh, lays down with the lamb. It's a city of no death. It's a city of no sorrow. And what's going on in Isaiah is, is what Isaiah is saying is if you can spend yourself for the cause of the underprivileged in the world, then not only will God give you strength, but you also get to be a repairer of broken walls and be the person that's helping God with his project of building a better city. And so the question becomes... If Jesus were to give you a title, like if you had a blank name tag on your shirt and Jesus came over with a pen, do you think he could give you that title? Do you live your life in such a way that you are a repairer of the great city of God? Do you practice justice? 
third promise he makes. It's very simple. At the end of Isaiah 58, Isaiah says this, when you spend yourself on behalf of the weak, you find joy in the Lord. You see, so many of us are on a quest to find joy in life. What if joy came from justice? You see, the irony is that authentic worship should produce tangible justice, but the opposite is also true. Tangible justice leads towards authentic worship and joy. One of the greatest evils in our day, or one of the greatest evils impersonated in a human being, is a man named Joseph Coney. And for the last several decades, he has been terrorizing much of East Africa. What he does is he goes into little vill- into villages and he kidnaps children and he brainwashes these children to become soldiers in his army. And the rule is very simple. These kids must kill or be killed. These children are abused in the worst ways possible. And over the last two decades, Joseph Coney's army of children has displaced 1.5 million people from their homes in East Africa. And even worse, they have kidnapped 38,000 children. Now, there are some people in the world who are standing up to this and trying to do something about it, and there's one particular organization which is taking a lead role in helping children who escape the Lord's Resistance Army, LRA. There's an organization which helps them rehabilitate. It's called the Children for War, of War Center. And one man that's associated with the Ch- uh, Children of War Center is a man named Richard Stearns, and he wrote a book called whole in the gospel and in his book he tells the story of one of these days when two young boys come in uh, come out of the lord's resistant army and into the new community and it's amazing the way he describes this story he says that he's sitting at, he's at one of these facilities there's about 40 children who have already been uh, released from slavery they've escaped and there's about 12 workers and they're all standing outside and all of a sudden this black suv drives into the facility and the door opens and these two teenager teenage boys get out their names are michael and joseph and the way that which richard R- stearns describes them is he says when they got out of the car he said the first thing he saw was their eyes and their eyes had that black hollow stare exactly the way you would think that the eyes of someone would look who had gone through the abuse that these children had gone through. Not only did their eyes have this black, empty hollowness to them, but their bodies were trembling. They were terrified. And the reason they were terrified is because when children enter into the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army, they are brainwashed from a very early age that if they ever escape or if they are ever rescued, they are told that the outside world will kill them. They are told who would want you. You all are child murderers. No one cares about you. Your parents don't care about you. Anybody that rescues you will kill you. And so from a very young age, these kids are brainwashed. And so little Michael and little Joseph have just been rescued from the LRA, stuck in this van, and they're riding to this place, and they think they're about to die. And they get out of the car, and these 40 children and 12 adults erupt in celebration that they have finally found a new home. And Michael and Joseph look out in the sea of faces and they see people that used to be slaves with them. They see their old friends that they thought were dead. Richard Stearns tells us that after they get done celebrating, everybody walks into this makeshift chapel for a church service. If you'll put this quote on the screen, this is from that book, Hole in the Gospel. Soon all 50 of us poured into the makeshift chapel of corrugated tin and rough wooden benches in the compound. A spontaneous worship service erupted as the songs of God's, uh, of God's healing and forgiveness and power were sung over and over again. Welcome home. Welcome home, Michael and Joseph. You are home now. The good news, the glorious life-transforming gospel washed over Michael and Joseph And in that moment, the unthinkable possibility of forgiveness broke over them like a new dawn. They could be forgiven. You see, what happens when you see tangible justice happen in the world, it leads to authentic worship. 
You see, as I picture that scene in my head, these people aren't worshiping God because they have to or because it's some obligation. They're worshiping God because they can't help it. They've seen the gospel happen. This is someone who has gone from slavery and has now been liberated. And they can't help but praise the God who wants justice to happen. You see, ultimately, practicers of justice become praisers of Jesus because in the end, worship and justice are two sides of the exact same coin. So where in your week do you practice justice? Where in your life do you lift up the poor and seek out the brokenhearted? And if, as you analyze your life, you realize that you don't do anything for justice in the world, then what makes you different than the people in Isaiah 58? Is it possible that God would come down and look at your life and say, I love your prayers, I love your praise, I love your church attendance, but I'm not impressed because you're not seeking justice in the world. And here's, here's what you can do. I didn't have time in the sermon to go over many practical ways to engage justice in the community. So if you have a bulletin today, take it home. There's nine or ten ways that you can volunteer through this church family to practice justice in the world. But even if you don't do that, you don't have to, you don't have, to have someone ask you to be a practicer of justice. You go do it in your context. Because ultimately, you have to answer to God on the day of judgment did you do anything for the people around you? Did you bring j justice to the poor and the oppressed in your community? So as we close today, I don't know where you are. Some of you are thinking, man, I, I need justice in my life. If that's you, read your bulletin, go home, have a conversation with a friend or your family about one thing you can do this week to add to your life to be a practicer of justice in the world. Some of you, you're really far away from Jesus and you've never experienced the forgiving power of His grace? Maybe as you watched the baptism video earlier, you thought, wow, all these people are being baptized. I've never done that. Well, if you want to do it, we can do that today. Others of you are just in a really broken place. And maybe you're in a place where you need the church of God to surround you and lift you up in prayer. If there's anything that this church family can do for you, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.